Welcome everyone, wherever you are tuned in. And uh, I'd like to thank the Lord for making it uh, possible that uh, we be in the year 2023. And uh, I know that uh, he has uh, a purpose why we have crossed into a new year. And uh, I'm glad that the Lord has uh, kept me alive. I'd like to welcome us to this series of uh, the Jewish wedding model. This uh, is a fresh uh, information that uh, maybe you have never come across, but I'm praying that uh, as we look at this material that the Lord will bless us and uh, we shall be able to understand his will and uh, what he would like us to be and how to conduct our marriages. And so uh, I'll offer a word of prayer and then uh, we can be able to delve into the series fully on the Jewish wedding model. Our Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thy name. We approach the throne of grace with thanksgiving, knowing that all that we have and all we are it is because of your mercies that we have not been consumed, but probation has been extended unto us that we may glorify your name. As we learn, Father, help us to rededicate ourselves unto thee, that we may do that which is the perfect will through the ministration of the Spirit and the presence of thy holy angels among us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, welcome. This is uh, part one of the Jewish wedding model. And uh, we shall be looking at um, the ancient Hebrew wedding model, histro uh, history and uh, biblical times. Now, marriage is a very solemn institution. We are told that uh, it is a twin institution to the Sabbath. And so if there was something to be handled with the much solemnity, it is the issue of marriage. And so a preparation has to be made before uh, the people that will get into the marriage, they get into it. Uh, in this series, we shall be looking at the introduction uh, and uh, look into the ancient Hebrew model, uh, wedding model. Uh, understanding it is cultural aspect of the scriptures will help us understand scripture on a deeper level because we understand that uh, when we talk about marriage, it's uh, a picture of uh, Christ and his church, Christ being the bridegroom and the church being the bride. And so the marriage relation as it is, it is a miniature of how God or how Christ deals with his own church. Entering into it without understanding that will uh, uh, make us not represent fully what uh, Christ intended that the marriage uh, institution should represent. Looking at this also historical background, we will understand things in regard to prophecy when we we, we enter into the book of Matthew chapter 25 and look at the 10 uh, virgins, five wise and uh, um, uh, five foolish. Uh, as we enter fully into the series, then uh, we shall understand the things about prophecy, Revelation chapter 18, the things that we have not been understanding, we shall be able to understand them as we look at the history uh, 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 of the ancient Hebrew wedding model. Also, as we look at this history, it will help us understand our relationship to our Messiah and our bridegroom. It will also help us understand our work in this faith and how we ought to be acting and uh, preparing. Um, modern day weddings and the lead up to them is much different to how weddings were planned and conducted back in uh, biblical times. And so, um, I want us to understand some steps to marriage 
for those who are looking forward to marriage. And if you have entered into this institution, but uh, you never knew what it was um, required of thee, then it is not late to remedy the defects. We can always try to make the best out of what we have currently. There were several stages to a Hebrew wedding. The first stage was called Shidukin, that is the match making stage. Uh, and then we have the uh, Erusin, the betrothal stage, where actually uh, um, the bride price could be negotiated. And then um, uh, 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 there will be that espousal period where actually it seems like you are married, but uh, the marriage itself, it has not been consummated. And then we have the Nisuin, which is the marriage itself. Each stage had certain ceremonies and practices associated uh, with it. And so these are the very important stages when you talk about the uh, Jewish, uh, the Hebrew wedding model. And those three stages are the Shudukin, that is the matchmaking stage, maybe what you will call the uh, engagement come courtship. And then we have, um, uh, uh, I mean, courtship. And then we have the betrothal stage, which is the engagement, where actually you, in this engagement, you can decide to pay the dowry and stay apart for 12 months before you get into marriage. And then we have the Nisuin, which is the marriage itself, when it is cons uh, uh, consummated. Uh, and th this uh, can be found in, in many places in the scripture. Uh, and uh, just looking at Genesis chapter 2, verses uh, uh, 18, the book of Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 18, this is uh, what uh, we find that uh, God, that is the Elohim, said it is not good for the man to be alone. Uh, uh, I'm going to make a helper for him as his counterpart, that is a help meet. I'm going to make a, a help meet unto him. Uh, after Adam naming every animal, uh, the Lord saw that um, it was only Adam that did not have his own kind. And so uh, he said that I'll make him a counterpart. I'll make him a help meet. And so Shudikin refers to the preliminary arrangements prior to a legal betrothal. And I told you the betrothal is the engagement where actually we shall see that there are certificates which were even signed so that if you wanted to come out of this betrothal or engagement, then you will have to see the people who guided you to sign these certificates. And so in ancient times, marriage was looked upon as a more of an alliance for reasons of survival or practice. Uh, practicality. It was not just a man getting a lady and deciding that we are going to live together, but uh, it was bringing together the two different families so that they may be able to correlate and affect each other in a positive way. Many times you find that this is not the kind of uh, marriages that we have in these days where actually two families are coming to bed together to be one family. Now, how does that represent the, the, the plan of redemption per se? Jesus Christ being of the divinity or the divine family takes a lady or takes the church which is of humanity and then it is divinity combined with humanity. This is victory over sin. And this is what the wedding or the marriage had to bring in uh, the people who are involved in. It was not an institution that you enter in to have more problems, but to help each other be Christians. Most of the marriages that we have these days are not meeting the desired expectations of Jesus Christ that each marriage in this sin sick world is to help the other partner overcome sin. But then we find that um, the two family trees were coming together so that they may be one, no longer two families, but one family. And so Christ being the bridegroom left heaven and came on the earth to take the bride, which is his church, 
two different families of two different kinds, but when they join together, they can cleave together and they will help each other not to be in sin. And this is the kind of picture we want to bring out when we are talking about um, marriage, uh, relationship, and all that stuff. The concept of romantic love remained a secondary issue if considered at all. Romantic love grew over time. And uh, that one you can find, uh, I'll just give you a verse in the book of uh, Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, the issue of Rebecca and Isaac. Uh, the point being that um, romance was the last thing that you could think of in a marriage relationship, but um, it was ties that binds that could bring people together so that they may put away their differences and be of one mind, be of uh, the same goals and all that stuff. And so talking about romance, romance was considered as the last thing in this aspect. And uh, that one, we, we can just prove it by the book of uh, Genesis chapter um, Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. This is uh, after bringing her in and after being of one mind, then you find the Bible records that he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And so you could not say that um, prior Isaac had ever met Rebecca, and so he could be attracted to her in a romantic way in any way. And so uh, that could contribute to the marriage alliance. Although I know there are so many quotes that E.G. White says that never marry the person whom you do not love. But um, going, uh, I don't think she conflict the scriptures. Uh, uh, and um, Isaac could not hate Rebecca because Rebecca was from the same family. She was from the uncle side and no one hates the relatives. So although there was that romance, which uh, actually Sister White talks about, never marry somebody whom you cannot love. There was the first aspect of it that uh, these were the enjoining uh, to strengthen the family relationship rather than just being a marriage contracted because people looked at each other and they said, we fell in love with um, each uh, other. And so uh, the first step, with this, which is the shurikin, it was generally the fathers that did the deliberating at this stage. It is interesting to find that um, it is the fathers which did the shurikin, uh, um, uh, and uh, you could get that from uh, when uh, uh, God himself gave Adam the person that uh, he could marry. It is God who brought Eve to Adam. And so the father generally was the one who deliberated at this stage. It was common for children to be betrothed to each other in those days. And you can say that the Jewish wedding or the Hebrew wedding model cannot apply to us these days because uh, 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 people don't marry relatives per se or the people that are related. But that is not the way uh, that you should look at the thing. At the end of the day, you will find that um, we should be getting into marriage with the people whom we are well acquainted with so that... Um, uh, we may not enter into a marriage relationship and then we find that there are things which we overlooked and then we find that they are becoming a thorn in our flesh. However, it was so seldom that marriages were forced young people that had no interest for each other. And uh, uh, you understand, Sister White says that um, will the parent select a spouse for his child? Uh, uh, and uh, she says that uh, if the, part, the, the, the one party goes and select a partner without considering the parents, that marriage should never be. And so good parents will not select a bad partner to their children. And so in ultra-Orthodox Judaism today, many marriages are still arranged by a marriage broker or a matchmaker called a shadihan. 
and it is considered an exalted and holy vocation to find and arrange a good marital match called a shidduh between a man and a woman. Now, uh, uh, you will say that uh, we are having different cultural backgrounds and my parents are not uh, maybe the same of my religion. And so it will be so difficult for my parent to select for me a spouse and so on. But um, I would like you to consider one thing that um, a young man and or a young lady who takes a spouse and this spouse, they cannot correlate with the parents, actually does the parents injustice, not considering that uh, these are the people who have carried him or her in the womb for nine months. And also they are the ones who have been able to educate this person and be able to provide for them. So choosing a partner, uh, without thinking of how your parents will feel like that is actually violating the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother so that thy days belong. You will find that where the parents are not um, correlating well with the spouse or the partner you have chosen, it will be so hard to knit this family together as even Christ intends the marriage relation should be, that two families are coming together to hold pen each other to everlasting kingdom and not to separate each other per eternity. And so uh, the issue of selecting a partner, the issue of courtship, the parents should be consulted, their interests, their likes, and what they would like to wish. I'm not saying that they are the final decision, but they are the counselors. And we are told in the multitude of counsel, there is peace. And so you look at um, what um, uh, um, that is um, uh, Samson did. Uh, instead of consulting the parents, he went down to Timna and saw a woman in Timna of the daughters of the Philistines. First of all, the Israelites did not have to marry some strange uh, women or people who are not the worshippers of true God. But this Nazarene, who, who is called um, uh, uh, Samson, goes to Timna and he is marrying from the Philistine, the very people that the Lord had told Israelites, don't do it. And this is violating your respect to the parents. And he went up and informed his father, that is in Judges chapter 14, and mother saying, I have seen a woman in Tim of the daughters of the Philistine, and how now take her for me for a wife. He is not just informing them so that uh, they may advise him more, but he is informing them after making a decision, come rain, come sunshine, this is the person I'm taking. And when you read Judges chapter 14, verse 3, that um, the father and the mother said unto him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brothers or among all my people that you should take away from the uncircumcised Philistine? And uh, a Samson said to his father, take her for me for she is pleasing in my eyes. And so you find that the two families of uh, the Israelites and the Philistine could not correlate. And so this marriage was going to prove to be a failure from the word go. And many of us make these steps we go and we don't consult our parents and we enter into courtship, which is the should him without consulting the parents. And then we find ourselves in loggerheads with our parents. They cannot visit our families. Your parents cannot visit your in-laws. And so these two families are broken instead of coming together as Christ intended, as even he is of heaven and he came on earth to unite the family of heaven and the family of earth. When, when we start entering into marriage relation without considering the redemption plan, then we lose the very aspect of uh, what is marriage. And so um, in Judges chapter 14, however, his mother and uh, his father did not know that it was of God and uh, he was seeking an occasion against the Philistine. So uh, Samson went down to Timna with his father and mother and came to the vineyard of Timna and saw a young lamb came roaring at him. It was during this stage that the formal proposal was made. Thus began the process of setting the terms of marriage, seeing the lady and then informing the parents. And then the parents had to go and uh, meet um, the parents of uh, the, the lady. The next stage we saw was the stage of uh, a, a, a Rusin. The next stage was the betrothal stage 
where actually you discuss the engagement matters, the bride price. Once the match had been made, the terms of marriage would be made and set in form of um, uh, a ketuba or a writing. The ketuba was a legally binding document. Its primarily purpose was to protect the bride. And so when um, uh, it is interesting, when you enter into a, a Rusin, you are engaged to this um, a uh, young lady and either you will pay the full bride price or a uh, part of the bride price so as the bride may be protected. Now, this is interesting because when the father saw that humanity was for redemption and it was the best bride for his son, he sent his son on earth and the son died on Calvary, which is the bride price or part of the bride price. And then he did not take the lady. Jesus Christ went back to heaven and then he is doing atonement. When atonement is finished, then he come back to take the bride. And so there's that period between uh, Erosin and uh, the marriage itself, the consummation of marriage. And then this is the time. If you have to leave the bride, then you have to go back and you write. Uh, you 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 annul the document that uh, or the ketuba you had signed at that moment, and so when Joseph and Mary were to be married, they they were in this period, and uh, you see, for Joseph to leave Mary, it was called a divorce. They had not been married; they were just in Erusin, and then uh, uh, leaving her. The, it, it could have forced him to go back and be able to sign the documents once again that he is leaving. But um, seeing that uh, in this period, some part of bride price was paid or the full amount of it, it was a very important stage that uh, you had accepted, you are committed to this lady and you didn't have to look at another person. It was the lady and that lady. And I wish if we could conduct our, uh, our stages of marriage in this way, it will guard over all the evils we see about people entering into engagements and tomorrow you find that they have broken up. It is a violation and uh, you will find that uh, Sister White says that it is some, um, uh, 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 the, the, uh, it is flirting with hearts actually. It is not um, a, a good thing, and the Lord will judge many people for doing this. They are in the habit of breaking other people's heart. They enter into engagement. They are out. They enter in. They are out. But what if you had paid the full bride price? You don't go to live with the lady. There's a 12-month period where you are not getting her into the house for marriage, but just waiting and developing the character that is fit for that. And so... Uh, the ketuba or that writing was a legal binding that uh, in quotes that you are married to this lady and uh, it was to protect her uh, from anyone approaching her or you approaching any person. The father of the bride would use his wisdom to look out for the best interest of his daughter. It was not also a business per se because um, uh, many people have turned marriage relations in, uh, into business. and. Uh, Part of um, the bride price that you had given during the Erusin or Yerusin, uh, what you will do when you get married, it will give, be given back to you half of the bride price. And so uh, 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 you, you can find that uh, in the book of uh, Genesis that Laban did not return part of the bride price to Jacob and Patriarchs and Prophet says that this was not how God intended it. Uh, to be. Uh, um, today, if you will tell somebody that on the day that you are marrying the lady, they bring back a half the bride price, I think you will face the music. And so um, the bride was seen as a being completely under her father's control. And from there in, after signing this ketuba or this document, she was there to wait for the husband and maintain the purity. She didn't have to mingle with a lot of people. She didn't have to go out, out alone. She had to go out accompanied by somebody so that uh, somebody will not take advantage of her. 
or she will not enter into a problem and then the husband-to-be rejects her. So, for example, if a man sleeps with a virgin, they generally got married, but her father had to consent. And uh, if you were betrothed and uh, you were defiled somehow, then you were stoned to death and uh, the father would return the bride price. And so at this moment, it was a critical moment. And um, as we see, Christ has paid the bride price and he is atoning for us to complete justification. And we are to wait. We don't have to wait involving ourselves in uh, um, civilian things. In fact, uh, uh, in the book of uh, Timothy, if I can get it, uh, in the book of uh, Timothy. Uh, a soldier doesn't entangle himself uh, in um, civilian affairs. Uh, this should be in the book of either first Timothy, second Timothy or first Sec, uh, this is second Timothy chapter two verses four. Second Timothy chapter two verses four. And uh, I like just to bring it to your attention. No man that worrieth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so it was when the woman was betrothed, she didn't have to entangle herself with the issues of this life and be known to the father or go outside an accumbent. And as we have been betrothed to Christ, we have to take care of our life that nothing happens to us that uh, will make us again be defiled and not be acceptable before the Lord. Um, and so, uh, continued on, you, you can find also that in Exodus chapter 22, where the, the, the lady who had been betrothed had to be really uh, 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 guarded so that nothing can happen to her. That is Exodus chapter 22, verses 16 and verses 17. And so this document called the Ketubah that was signed uh, 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 during the uh, Erusin, that is uh, the engagement period, um, we find that um, the, uh, the Ketubah consisted of several stipulations. The conditions and requirements of the groom and uh, the bride to each other, the bride's estate inventory, an accounting of assets, cash, property, livestock, business, etc., that the bride contributed to the new husband's estate when she married him. This is interesting, and you'll find it in the spirit of prophecy that um, in Adventist home, that um, a young lady who is being married, is she bringing something into the family, or is she coming to use uh, a vainly that which her husband has accumulated and is going to uh, 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 bring home? So uh, in this uh, ketubah or this document of engagement, we had the bride's estate inventory. What does the lady have that uh, will uh, really contribute to the marriage and can be able to help them live a life that uh, uh, is really uh, uh, not uh, uh, burdensome to the, to the bridegroom? The bride price, this was usually set as 50 shekels of silver and was a cash penalty for divorce without cause or taking a second wife without con consent and permission of the bride and or her father. You can find that in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 28 to 29, that um, that fee that was paid at Erusin engagement day and signed into a document was um, a fee uh, or some kind of penalty so that uh, it may guard over uh, the, the, the engagement. <clears throat> and then we had uh, the dowry, which is called the moha, the price of the bride paid by the groom's father or the groom to the bride's father. And so during the erusin, during the engagement before marriage, the bride price is paid and then the dowry is paid. Now you will think that this is so much um, of... Uh, uh, of a process or a ceremony 
but uh, actually it acted for the best uh, of uh, the parties which were getting into marriage. In ancient days, marriage was not an agreement between two individuals, but between two families. And I have touched on that newly married man usually did not find a new home for himself, but occupied a nook in his uh, father's house until um, in, uh, in some, uh, in some clans like uh, uh, where I come from, that uh, when you marry, you don't start cooking in your own house, but you cook in your mother's uh, kitchen for a period of one or two years, and then they can release you to go and start cooking in your own house. And uh, this, uh, um, this had been copied from the Jewish wedding model anciently that the newly married men or man usually did not find a new home for himself, but occupied a nook in his father's house or a place in his father's house. The family of the groom gained and the family of the bride lost, a valuable member who helped with all household uh, tasks. And so it was um, somehow a gain on the part of uh, the new family, <clears throat> in which way they had just acquired a daughter in their family. And so this daughter was to be treated like the daughter who was born in this family. And so, uh, but um, in this scenario with Jesus Christ, it is Jesus Christ who lost something because he will re uh, retain humanity forever. And so it was a sacrifice on the part of the husband when it comes to the redemption plan rather than the part of uh, the, the, the church or the, the lady or the, the groom. We, we have nothing to lose. In fact, all we have to give out are our sins and then Jesus Christ uh, has to lose some part of himself in that he will retain humanity forever. So it was a sacrifice on his part, being that he loved the church more than anything else. And this is the love that uh, even husbands have to have today that they will sacrifice everything for their wives, knowing that uh, they are weaker vessels and they are after sin under the desire of the husband. That is what the scripture says in Genesis chapter three after sin, that your desires shall be upon your husband. And so a man knowing that the desires of the woman shall be upon him, has to make sure that this woman lives comfortably and he has to sacrifice a lot instead of ex expecting the woman to sacrifice a lot. Better said than done, this is the, 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 the marriages that we have today. I wish that they could be according to the model that Christ wanted them to be. It was reasonable there for the father of the bride um, uh, receive the equivalent of her value as a useful member of um, uh, the family because she could not be replaced in any way, even if the father of the bride could uh, employ a maid, it was not as if it was the daughter that had left the family to go and join another family. And uh, in the course of time, the Mohar lost its original meaning as a purchase uh, pride, price paid to the father for his daughter and assumed the significance of a gift to the near relatives of uh, uh, the bride. And uh, just to reiterate a point that um, you can't buy a human being. And so whatever thing we call the dowry, actually, when you turn it into a business, it is called slavery. And uh, uh, it's like buying somebody. This is slavery it, uh, at, at its highest level. And people do not understand this, but when we come to Revelation chapter 18, you will see that slavery is happening in Revelation chapter 18, and God uh, punishes Babylon because of slavery. And some of the parents today are part of Babylon because they are selling their children as um, in uh, hiding behind what we call the bride price or the mohar, the dowry. It shouldn't be like that. You cannot sell a human being because uh, God is the owner of life and children are a gift from the Lord. It is not something that you have worked for and gotten. 
The Lord can decide to close your womb. The Lord can decide to close, to make sure that you are barren. But uh, the Lord has gifted you. And instead of appreciating the gift, when it reaches the material day of uh, the dowry, you try to sell out your daughter in the name that uh, you are negotiating the dowry. As far as back in uh, biblical times, it was customary for a good father to give the whole of the mohar or at least a large part of it to his daughter. And the, the, the reason, uh, uh, and you know that uh, the reason why people actually hike the dowry so much, it is because, or the mohar so much, it is because they don't even give it back when the lady is being married. This is the disaster part of it. But if it was being given the day that she's married, you will find that even the person says, okay, I don't need a dowry, just take my daughter and go. But because it is not something which is being not being returned, then the people are taking advantage and uh, start mechanize on this issue because they have... Um, really escaped another step, which is to return half of the muhar, that is the dowry, when the lady is getting married on the consummation day. And so uh, uh, we find that um, the shudukin has been uh, really violated, that process of uh, engaging your parents to be able to uh, approve of the person you are getting married to, the, that should king, that is the courtship, has been um, really violated, and the erusin also have been violated because the bride price we don't see it getting back to the family that it was given to, and then the man starts marriage with a lot of debt instead of relief, uh, which is not okay. And so um, these are the things that we can think about, and uh, if we can rectify our marriages, praise the Lord. If we are not going to rectify them, then I don't know what to say, but um, uh, I believe that uh, we are doing injustice and not understanding the plan of uh, 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 redemption. Now you ask, uh, you may ask, how is the part of the lady returning the bride price, how does it involve itself uh, in the in the in the in in the plan of redemption or Christ's relationship uh, with the church, these are the some of the things that we shall be examining. That um, uh, we we give our all unto Christ, uh, whatever He has given unto us, it is to be given back, so that um, it uh, helps in. Uh, Reaching to other people to come into salvation. So we have received from Christ, but we receive to give. And that is how the circuit of beneficent actually it is completed. So on top of the muhar or the gift uh, or um, the, what you'll call the dowry, the groom will give costly gifts called the matan to the bride as a sign of his commitment and a sign of his promise to return for her. And uh, these were um, gifts that were to bless the parents. And so this is the best part of it. You pay the muhar, which is the dowry, which shall be returned on the day that you are getting the lady for to consummate the marriage, but also you gave the gifts to the mother and to the father who have raised this daughter for you or this lady for you. The gifts were not returned, but they were given to the mother and to the father for an appreciation. So you can find that um, on the day that uh, you are signing the ketubah, the document for engagement, let us say that uh, the parents decide that um, the dowry is 100,000 you can decide, oh, okay, the dowry is 100,000, but I'm going to give you 250,000. And uh, this 150,000 on top, I'm just appreciating the mother, I'm appreciating the father, because they have raised a, a bride for me, they have taken care of her, they have educated her, and so I'm giving back. 
uh, I'm giving something to my parents, my new parents. And uh, uh, we, we don't find also that happening in these days. Uh, you hear men saying, oh, you can't pay the dowry. The dowry will pay until the day that uh, you die. Because if you have to meet the mother-in-law, you have to do some shopping. The father-in-law, you have to do some shopping. Uh, also that... Um, um, if you are going to visit them, you have to give them something and all that. And so they say, oh, you know, I cannot give gifts on the day of Mohar, the dowry, because, uh, you know, I'll be going to visit the, 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 the in-laws. And when I go there, I'll be taking them something. No, that is not the way that um, uh, 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 you should be reasoning. When uh, Christ betrothed the church, he never just redeemed them. He never just paid the mohar, the dowry, but he gave the gifts, which are the spiritual gifts. And these ones, we use them also, and uh, they are for our own benefit until we come to the full stature of the man, Jesus Christ. So beside the mohar, which is the dowry also, there is the matan or um, uh Am I missing the word? Yes, there is the, uh, the matan or the gifts, which are the gifts that Christ gives unto us, which aids us in our everyday living. And uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 4, 34, verses 11, we find the father of Shechem saying, uh, uh, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me that I may give. That is the gifts and the mohar uh, when... Um, uh, the, the 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 lady uh the, that is uh the sister to the to Simeon and uh, Levi uh, got into the 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 son of uh, Shechem and so in uh, Genesis chapter 34 verse 12 he says ask of me mohar and a gift matan ever so high and I I give according to what you say to me, but give me the girl for a wife. So he is ready to give the bride price, the mohar, and the gift, which is uh, the matan. You can find that in Genesis chapter um, 34, verses 12. I don't know if I can get it. Genesis 34, verses 12. <clears throat> yeah, I'll blow it on the screen so that you may see what the father of Shechem is saying here. Ask me never so much dowry, that is the mohar, and the gift, that is the matan. So there was during the, the ketubah, the engagement agreement where you sign the papers, you could give the dowry and the gift. And uh, the dowry was to safeguard uh, the engagement so that you will not go looking for another girl and the girl will not go looking for another man, but the gift was an appreciation for the parents of bringing the lady in this world uh, for you. And so once all the stipulations had been agreed upon the proceedings of the, the throne could have come, the groom and his father would go to the bride's father's house and knock on the door. The bride's decision would then be made known by whether the door was open or not. And if it was open, then he knew that um, uh, they had accepted him to be part of the family. Now, that is interesting because it makes me happy about knocking of the door, the bridegroom knocking at the door of um, the, the brides. And this is what we find in Revelation chapter 3. Uh, I think that it should be in verse 19 and 20 that uh, Christ is knocking at the heart uh, um, uh, the door of the heart so that we may open and he come in and sap in. If we open, then he'll come in and sap in, but alas, so many people are not opening and then the chance is going by. Um, we are rejecting Jesus Christ and uh, it was a serious thing for a bride to reject a bridegroom. You can think of that. Who was ready to pay her bride price and who was ready to give the gifts for her to be married. And so after the door is open, then will come the public ceremony of betrothal and everything will be written uh, down. And so um, 
they after they discuss the bride price the door is knocked and it's open he pays the bride price and then they proceed into like a reception place where he will give the matan remember we are just talking about the engagement we have not reached even at the marriage which happens in uh, uh actually revelation chapter 21 and then after all these things the copies were signed the copies of the ketubah were signed one given to the father of the bride one for the married couple or the engaged couple, a sealed copy for the local judicial court. And so the, you know, Israel was living under a theocratic, um, a theocratic government. And so it involved the judicial court for the ketubah or the engagement legal documents to be signed. And so one copy will remain with the judicial court and one to the to the bride and the bridegroom, uh, and this will be possessed by the uh, bridegroom, and the other will be for the father of the bride, and so three. But uh, in nowadays, we are given two documents when we go to uh, sign that in the court, and uh, uh, you, you are given, that is, uh, the people who are getting married, they are given that document. And so after it had signed, and each one given a copy, the groom, um, um, would go back to his father's house and prepare a place for him and his bride to dwell. Interesting, you read that in John chapter 14, we are told by Jesus Christ, ye believe in the father, also believe in me. In my father's uh, um, uh, uh, place, there's mansions. Uh, uh, I go to prepare for you. And uh, if I go to prepare for you, I'll come back and take you to myself so that wherever I am, ye also may be there. And so after the ketubah, these documents of engagement had been agreed as Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary, he went back to the Father and then he went to prepare a place so that in due time after 12 months, he may come and take us back. During this time, the bride will learn all about the groom and how to be a pleasing wife. And where will she learn this? Now that she were in this process of 12 months of betrothal, she could learn everything that she could learn. And this is where you hear about dating. Not dating as the world does it, but um, the, the bride could attend the bridegroom's parties and the bridegroom parties, uh, the bridegroom would attend the bride's parties. It will be a family affair and they are knowing each other what this one loves, how this one dresses, and all that stuff, how he talks. But they could not meet separately, two of them. No way. This was not. And so it is, I think, in this one of these visitations that Joseph realized that Mary was pregnant, and he wanted to divorce her secretly. And so the, 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 this was the best part was this part of dating also in engagement where actually it's like just you belong to the other family. The lady is like he, she belongs to your family and you as a man, you belong to the lady's family and you could interact openly, but with a lot of respect, knowing that people are watching you and you are learning each other's character and where actually uh, you see things are not okay. It is not about divorce or separation or cutting off the engagement, but uh, helping this person catch up before you come to the marriage so that when you come to the marriage, it will just be a fortress of heaven. And so this is what Christ is doing right now, that he went back to the Father, but he also visits us by his omnipresent, the Holy Spirit. And also we are in him and he in us. He gives us visions and dreams and he has illustrated well how heaven looks like. And so it's like we go to heaven and Christ comes on the earth by the Holy Spirit and all these revelations. And this is the best moment because you are an in, in intimate relationship with each other and you don't feel like separating from each other. This is how the engagement has to look like. But uh, as I said, alas, so many things are happening which are, are uh, out of the way. And... Uh, you know we have entered into marriages without knowing these things. And so marriages have become a galling young and uh, they don't seem as good as they should be. So uh, this is in uh, preparation to receiving the wedding garment. As the engagement continues going on, 
the lady is preparing so that one day she may be, repre be presented with um, a wedding uh, garment. Um, and so the, the messages during that, that time, uh, uh, um, we are told in some instances that uh, during the betrothal period, the bride and the groom will not see each other. Uh, 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 they, they, they will not get that close to each other. However, messages were usually passed between the two by the friend of the groom, by exchange of letters or by oral uh, 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 um, uh, passing of, in, of information to the best friends or the best couple so that uh, the information may be relayed. And uh, if, it, if anyone of them was involved in adultery, then uh, um, they could annul the ketubah. And uh, uh, we can go much deep into this in, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, but uh, I'll spare us for now Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 19, which is interesting when Christ speaks about uh, 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 divorce. It also covers what uh, you will call the engagement period because divorce is, was not, in the Jewish wedding model, divorce was not only when people had married, but when they were also still in betrothal period. And so Christ covers it in uh, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 5 and uh, the book of Matthew chapter 19 that uh, then you have to sign a uh, um, uh, you have to sign a certificate of divorce if uh, this engagement is broken. Uh, as uh, we look into coming to an end, uh, you should remember in the book of Malachi, uh, we are told that God hates divorce. In the book of Malachi chapter two, I, I presume God hates divorce. And so the people, because divorce covered the betrothal period, that is engagement period and the marriage period, uh, it was a serious thing to just um, pay the bride price to the lady. And during these 12 months of betrothal, you put her away. It was not a good uh, thing. And so uh, in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13, we are told, and this you have done a second time. You cover the altar with tears, with weeping and crying because he no longer regards the offering or receives it with pleasure from your hands. You know, some of the things we do or we have done in engagement in breaking other people's hearts and putting them away, uh, uh, actually God says that it is like flooding the altar with tears because we have uh, really... Uh, gone against that which we covenanted. And you say, why? Because it has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have acted treacherously, though she is your companion and the wife of the covenant. You agreed that you will marry this girl and then you go warring after another girl or you war warring after another man and then there is the signing of divorce. God hates divorce and he says in Malachi chapter 2 that... Um, Whoever divorces and whoever does these things is like flooding his altar with uh, tears. So he says in verse 16, for I hate divorce. I hate sending away. I hate this, uh, the, 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 the breaking apart. Now, this issue of breaking apart, I like just to bring to you the idea of uh, the divine sundering between the father and the son uh, uh, when Christ, the sins of the world were laid upon him. Now, remember, you are divorcing because of sin. And because of sin, you are tearing the heart of your partner aside. You are breaking her or him apart. And so Christ says, I hate, God says, I hate divorce. It is like the divine sundering when sin was over Jesus Christ. And uh, it happened at Calvary because of sin. But instead of separation, um, there's two things that happened at Calvary. The Jewish people divorcing themselves from Christ, according to the prophecy of uh, uh, Daniel chapter 9, it was so painful that the, he came unto his own, but his own rejected them, him because they went warring after other nations. And they said, we will have no, this man not rule over us. We have no other king but Caesar. 
yet Israel had covenanted to be the children of God in the Old Testament when they ended in a covenant with him at Mount Sinai. But when it reached that Christ came unto his own so that they may receive him and he may receive them, they crucified him and there was that divine sundering. And uh, uh, it was such a painful thing, Christ uh, having that divine sundering, not only with God, but with this, with the, the Jewish people because sin was upon him. And so uh, we are told such a thing will never happen again, the divine sundering. And it should not be happening at marriage level because marriage is a revelation of the redemption uh, plan. So let me see if I can bring this to an end. And uh, uh, the, the last part was uh, um, the Nisuin, where actually we said uh, we have the three parts that the Shiduhin, we have the Erusin, um, the, the, the Shiduhin being like a, a courtship and uh, the Erusin being like an engagement, and then the Nisuin, which is uh, now the wedding party or the matrimonial or uh, the uniting together, where actually the man will take um, the lady. When the groom came for his bride, there was a great procession of joy, jubilation, and shofar blast or the trumpet blast. And uh, those who were ready went into the marriage, and we will tackle that in the book of Matthew chapter 25. The bride will see the light of the procession in the night and have to go out and meet the groom as he came for her. And so we have the procession, we have the groom, and we have the bridemaids. And uh, we, um, uh, she had to have a light. Uh, she will have to light her oil lamp and go out to meet the groom and the foolish one were found without oil. So although the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, she did not know the exact day or hour. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ when um, the bride was to come and take the bride and that she be um, the wife. They had to stay for 12 months, that is a year of betrothal, but he, she was not told the day that the bridegroom was coming. So we do not know the day that Christ is coming to take the church unto himself. I think I love the lessons on marriage because uh, I'm finding them revealing a lot of things that um, I never understood before, but I'm now coming to understand them. And I can't say that I wish I knew because I wish I knew they're like horses. They are like dreams. You cannot chase after dreams and horses, but we can only salvage with that which remains uh, as we are still in this uh, tiring period. So it was the father of the groom who gave the final approval for him to return to collect his bride. And uh, you understand one thing with this, that Christ says that um, uh, the son doesn't know the day, but the language there is that the son does not reveal, but it's only the father that revealeth the day. So it is only the father of the bride that could give um, final approval to him to go and take the bride. So after everything has been prepared, the father sees that my son is ready to take the wife. He says that tomorrow you are going to take. Note that um, per se the son will not know. He could know, but the father is the one who could give the final approval. So Christ knows the day he's coming, but it is the father who will make no, known to the saints the day and the hour that it is coming. I, I think that uh, is interesting. For that reason, the bride kept her oil lamps ready at all times as the groom usually came in the night. And in Matthew chapter 25, you find that the oil went out. And some of us, because we have entered into marriage without understanding these things, even the second coming of Christ will get us unaware because first of all, the way we are relating with each other in marriage, if Christ came today, we will not enter. And the next thing, character-wise, we are not preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ, watching all the signs that are there so that we may know when he is approaching even at the doors. So the way you deal with your spouse, be it your wife, be it your husband, will... Um, really show manifest itself if you are preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ because if think about this if you get at cross with your spouse 
then you cannot have a morning devotion, you cannot have evening devotion, because how will you do it when you are not in good terms? And if Christ came at that time and found you in that state, how will you enter when you, the man of the house, you should be the priest preparing the flock to meet Christ? And then Christ comes and he finds that you are not preparing them. We are told that blessed is the servant when his master comes, he will find him giving uh, 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 his servants meat in due season. And so you are a servant to the family. If you are not relating well in your marriage, then you are that servant that is not giving meat in due season. So the way we relate at family levels really is a catalyst of the way we are preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so he will come and then the, they will finalize their vows and drink a cup of wine to signify their union. And so there was the last signing of the marriage certificate. The ketubah was just um, an engagement a document, but on the material day, <clears throat> there was the signing of uh, the marriage certificate then, and then they would drink a cup of wine to signify their union. And then uh, after this, there was the, 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 the honeymoon, but there was another ceremony, which was called the consummation of the marriage. Now, uh, this one is much interesting, but it is avoided so much today because uh, we have lived in sin and we have done things which are awkward and we will never want to, uh, to, 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 to consummate the marriage the way the Jewish people consummated their marriage. So when um, the bridegroom come to take the bride, they will sign the, 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 the marriage certificate and uh, uh, they will do what we call the consummation of the marriage. The consummation of the marriage is um, where the man and the woman entered into a house and then with a, a white cloth and then they would put uh, 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 below the lady and then the breaking of the virginity and the blood would go to the uh, cloth and then it will be given to the best couples uh, 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 to show the people that um, really this lady had preserved herself. But you, you, you can do that today. It is, uh, uh, I, I think it's something that should be done. It is not done. Um, and you know better reasons that I know why that is not done today. That is what we call the consummation of the marriage. And then that cloth was kept so that um, if the man ever accused the lady of something, then that uh, cloth will be reproduced and then the man will pay another bride price for accusing this lady falsely that she never kept herself pure. If the man abused the lady, anyone that generates towards halotry, then he will again pay the bride price because the cloth was there to prove that he got the lady when she was a virgin. And so it guarded against, that cloth guarded against uh, abuses that women suffer in their marriage uh, from men being called all these um, uh, uh, prostitution now. Uh, uh, um, names and uh, halotry names and abuses. Uh, this cloth guarded against that so that if the man did that to the lady, then the lady will report to the parents and the parents will come with the cloth. And if the matter be ascertained that the husband really abused the lady towards anything that um, gendered towards that she was a halot or she was a prostitute, uh, before marriage, yet the cloth could have a virginity, then the man would be punished. He could pay the bride price of a virgin once again. And so after this, uh, after this was presented, after the cloth was presented, after the consummation of the marriage, both the groom and the bride will sign several formal witnesses to the event that will wait outside or in a joining room while the couple consummated the marriage in the wedding bed. After this, uh, then... Uh, uh, we had what we call, um, uh, we had what we call the honeymoon, the honeymoon, where actually, when you read the book of Numbers, a person who had married will not go to the war. 
and uh, he will remain at home and be able to enjoy the days of the honeymoon where he will not do anything that would cause him to die or the woman to die and they be one be left uh, a, a widow or a widower in that early stages of their life. So he just remained at home. There was no war. Now, this is important because when Christ comes to take the church, the church will go for a honeymoon for a thousand years in heaven. No war and war shall never rise again. Unlike the Jewish people, after the honeymoon, maybe you will be enlisted in the army and go to war. When Christ comes, we are not going to war again. In fact, when Satan tries to take over the new Jerusalem, Christ, uh, the Father, the fire from the Father will be able to uh, uh, clean the earth and remove all sin and sinners from the earth. And so the Father will protect the Son and the daughter-in-law so that they may not be involved in any war. Fire from heaven will come and clean the earth. And so this was um, uh, after this. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, if ever people go to honeymoon anymore these days. And so um, the bride again now will take after uh, uh, the, the honeymoon, the, then they will go and take a place where they will live there after happily. Now, um, after a thousand years, the meek shall inherit the earth, Matthew chapter 5. After honeymoon in heaven, we shall come back here on earth. Being that Christ has forfeited being in heaven, he will be here on earth. The tabernacle of God shall be with his people forever and ever. And so, um, we are looking forward to this consummation of the marriage um, and then uh, we shall live ever after uh, with Christ for forever and uh, without any uh, problem. And so how I pray that um, with this historical background, we can be able to see how entering marriage is um, a very important thing, a very important thing because many people are entering into marriage. They don't understand the historical background and the things involved in. And so uh, marriage relationship are, um, are ended in carelessly. And uh, uh, just in closing, I'd like to repeat um, uh, the, the process of entering into marriage, the three stages. And uh, we saw that uh, we had the uh, uh, Shiduhin, um, which was um, like a courtship, finding a match, setting out the terms of covenant. And then we had the Erusin, which is the bride and bridegroom under, uh, undergo mikveh, that is the giving of the matan, the signing of the ketubah, the covenantal meal, and a cup of wine which uh, you find that uh, Jesus said, drink this because it's the blood of my covenant and not drink of it until in the kingdom. So in the consummation of the marriage, Jesus Christ will be able to drink the wine again. And then Swin, which is the marriage, the groom coming to take his bride home announced by his uh, to witness the finalization of the vows and the cup of wine, then the consummation, then the wedding feast, and then you could have the wedding. And so uh, uh, an example of this, um, you will find an example of this happening in Genesis chapter 24, where we have the marriage of uh, uh, Rebecca and uh, Isaac, and uh, everything was done according to the Jewish wedding model. And Abraham was old, advanced in years, and had blessed Abraham, God had blessed Abraham in every way. And Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, that is Eliezer, please put your hand under my thigh so that I may make you swear by Elohim, uh, uh, the Elohim of the heavens and the Elohim of the earth, that you do not take away from my son from daughters of Canaanites among whom I dwell, but go to my land and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, that is Yitzhak. And so uh, that is the historical background that uh, I can lay forth. Uh, I believe that um, uh, we will see where 
we have really messed up in all of these things and uh, uh, be able to rectify. And uh, I know if we follow this uh, Jewish wedding model, many things that crop up in marriage can be protected. And uh, many of uh, the breakups that people go through will be guarded against. Uh, you know, I, I have to say this in closing that uh, Satan promised Eve to live a good life when she went against the word of God. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> we have been uh, educated to think if we take these shortcuts towards our marriage relation, then uh, uh, and it will be better with us. But uh, you can find that uh, when Eve violated the word of God, it never went well with him. And so if we miss the step that uh, we are talking about, we may end up in marriage and luckily enough, it may seem like it's working, but it's not according to the will of God. And uh, then uh, there are things that we will never be able to respect each other with because we never did them uh, at the appropriate time. It is only by following the uh, Lord's way that uh, we shall have a life that um, uh, it is um, uh, full uh, of happiness. And so in uh, part two uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the history of uh, the Jewish wedding model, we shall look at the examples in the Bible that really made these things that um, we are talking about. We shall look at the examples of um, the things that uh, we are talking about and um, we shall see how these people went through the three stages, the Shiduhin, the Erusin, and Nisuin. And uh, I know the Lord bl will bless us. Otherwise, God bless you all. And uh, I hope that uh, you will watch um, this uh, six-part series and uh, we shall be able to be educated together and learn and see how the marriage plan is directly related to the redemption plan. And so if we enter into it in missing the steps, then we are creating a shortcut to heaven, which is an impossibility. The reason why 90% of the marriages are not working, it's because people have tried to take the shortcuts. But if they will go God's way, then things could have been okay. May the Lord bless us and uh, we shall really close with um, a word of Prayer. Let us close with um, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, Lord, we know that uh, information is good only if it is put in practice. And we want to put everything in practice. I pray that uh, those who have not entered in marriage will consider these things. And those who are already in it, Lord, we shall repent of the things that we have done, not according to your will. Above all, Lord, we are waiting for Jesus Christ to come and consummate his marriage with the church. Lord, we pray that we be part of it, not to be like uh, five foolish virgins, but we be like the five wise virgins. Help us to trim our lamps that he may not appear to us unaware, but Lord, he may find us when we are still the children of the light. This is my prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.